Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first of our workshops uh, for the rural development for to address uh, aquatic vegetation, trash, and debris entering uh, the district's waterways at the Central and South Florida Flood Control System and other works of the district. Uh, we took this presentation, a form of it, to the governing board in December and received authorization to begin the process to develop the rules uh, governing this uh, process that we're going to we're entering into. Um, I just kind of want to open up by saying, you know, the district is looking to begin this process in a very collaborative way. So we're having our public workshops to get input from everyone uh, so we can take that all into consideration as we develop the rule. Um, basically, we're, we're trying to look for people to, in the, the 298 districts, other f folks that connect to the district system, uh, whether they be through open connection, culverts, water control structures, um, whatever the connection to the district system is to help us manage uh, aquatic uh, floating debris and vegetation that comes into your system to help prevent it coming into ours, as well as trash, litter, and other debris. Um, over the last few years, the district has really stepped up its efforts to manage um, the, what we call our tough booms, our devices in front of our water control structures to keep them clean and the system open and running properly to prevent uh, flood, flood damage if stuff gets caught in our structures. And eventually, you know, all of this uh, along the East Coast discharges to um, the coastal waters and the estuaries such as uh, Lake Worth Lagoon, Indian River Lagoon, Biscayne Bay, and we're trying to protect those water resources as well. Um, but we want to go into this as a collaborative effort in trying to get everyone to kind of do their share of what we think is their share of managing their system to prevent that, those discharges into our system. If we all collect at our locations, I think we can do a much better job of protecting uh, the resources in the, in the estuaries as well as maintaining the flood control system in, the, in its optimum condition. Um, obviously, the district is not trying to get itself out of the debris collection at our coastal and our water control structures. We know that that is our bit, part of our mission and is going to be ongoing uh, for the duration. You know, um, most of our pumping stations have automated collection systems on, uh, located in, on them that uh, pull debris and everything from the water. Uh, in areas where we have uh, like a, a, a spillway along the East Coast or other water control structures, they typically do not have automated trash systems on them. So that a lot of that work has to be done manually and it is very labor intensive, time, time and resource intensive. Um, and um, we're just looking to see that everybody step up their game, including us, which we have to, to uh, manage this stuff. If we do a better job at removing and collecting and preventing, we also uh, work towards you know, reductions in herbicide applications, which is a big concern by a lot of folks out there, including the district. So I'm gonna run through this presentation. It's the same one that we did for the governing board, modified slightly to include uh, some, what we would consider the best management practices that we would uh, anticipate uh, the public and the 298s and the special districts and stuff to start to implement if they haven't already uh, to help prevent these discharges. And then Mara Cruz is going to come up and go over the, uh, the rulemaking process and some general information on that. Um, and then we're going to take comment at the end. So if you guys would hold your comments till then, uh, we're going to take comments from folks online. We're going to take comments from folks here in the room. Uh, you're welcome to just make statements or comments or ask us questions. If we can answer the question and it's simple enough in, in its nature, we will try to address that here today. If it's a complex question that we have to do research and go back to, to really uh, formulate a good answer for you, we're going to go back and take that into consideration. Um, if it would probably be best if you really want to make sure that your comments are considered and included uh, to submit them in writing at some point to the district. Um, not to say that we're not going to be taking notes and looking at the recording video and, in progress and all. But um, I guess I started maybe a little early, but um, 
Uh, hopefully everyone online did hear my opening comments. So uh, I'm gonna run through this and we're, we're looking at the system from a north to south perspective along the coast. And you're gonna see as I run through this that issues in the north are not the same as the issues in the south. The issues in the north tend to be more in vegetation in nature. And as we transition from north to south, you're, see, you're gonna see these things really convert to a trash and litter and debris issue uh, in the south, like the Miami-Dade area. So each, as I go through this, I'm gonna be looking at a map here. This is the uh, Martin St. Lucie area. These are several of the structures of areas of concern in the St. Lucie Martin County area that we have uh, significant accumulation of aquatic vegetation in these areas. So we had the C25 extension, the C25, the coastal structures in uh, S99, 49, and 97. So as I was mentioning earlier, obstructions like floating vegetation, if not promptly removed, can cause blockages of canals and water control structures, which potentially could lead to flooding. The floating uh, vegetation eventually discharges to the estuaries and can have negative impacts to water quality as well as marine life. This is a couple of the structures that were mentioned, the S99 and S97 on the C25 and 23 canals. Look into the west direction. You can see here the significant accumulation of floating vegetation upstream of these, these structures that uh, needs to be removed and dealt with and, and not allowed to discharge through the structure. And I think mainly we're looking at here at water hyacinth and water lettuce for the most part. So this map is basically to just emphasize the light blue lines are all these secondary canals that lie out there in that area that all have potential discharge points to the district system and just how extensive that is and how, you know, how, much, how many potential inputs there are uh, to the uh, Central and South Florida flood control system. This is just one of our project culverts, a, a photo of a project culvert. Now project culverts, I don't know if everybody knows what they are, but when the Corps originally uh, dug all the canals to provide flood control for these regions, of course you don't want flood waters and drainage waters to run over land and into the canal because it erodes the canal bank. So you have controlled points of discharge into the canals through what we call project culverts or PCs. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of these PC culverts that discharge from private lands into the district system. You can see here, there's an extensive amount of floating vegetation built up in this one. You do see the orange uh, floating boom in front of the structure, um, trying to you know, block this, the vegetation from entering um, through the, this structure and into the, our canal. Just a couple of pictures of uh, vegetation being discharged to the district canals from private ones, such as the C25 extension. And you can just see how significant this is, at this time anyways, because as you all know, it's seasonal and when, when this stuff blooms and uh, a lot of this vegetation can double in rates in, in like a two week period, go from a small patch to a very large or con completely full canal. So of course, when the rains start, this stuff breaks loose and starts flowing and a lot of it, like on the C25 extension, enters the C25 canal where it has to be dealt with. Well, the C25 being one of our major canals <clears throat> in the St. Lucie area, it drains approximately or provides flood control to like a third of the county. It's 17 miles long. It eventually discharges to the Indian River Lagoon. Um, we have large amounts of vegetation accumulating upstream of the C25 in the privately owned area known as the C25 extension. And I'm not trying to single out just that one out, it's just that over the last few years it's one that we've documented very well. There are other areas out there that we have same issues and problems and, you know, the picture on the right shows a well-maintained C25 canal open and ready to provide flood control and move water. When we do have an event, we have to mobilize equipment to uh, remove all of this vegetation. You can see here on the picture on the left, there's, we've got a long reach backhoe out there, you know, dipping as we call it, dipping, and uh, we remove vegetation that way. 
Um, in most cases, when we have a big event like this, it takes two to three of these backhoes in the location, and we also have to put a boat in the water, or, and we use the boat to push the vegetation to the bank so that the, the long-reach backhoe can then grab it and pull it out. We'll then allow the vegetation to dry for a certain amount of time to let the water flow out so we don't have to haul just a lot of weight and a lot of water, and then we'll properly dispose of this off-site somewhere, whether it be on district lands or to a landfill. Uh, this, this set of photos just kind of emphasizes the fact that, you know, it doesn't just impact the district, but floating debris like this can cause damage to private structures, like this bridge was damaged. Um, if you can see here in this picture, the center piling of the picture on the left has actually been sheared or snapped off. Uh, this bridge had to be removed and replaced by a plant private landowner. Here's just some totals from uh, FY 19 through 21 for the C25 canal of cubic yards of material removed. Of course, the 19 event was pretty significant. And then the other ones are averaging out somewhere in the four to 500 cubic yards per year. These are probably somewhere around three to four major events that uh, result in these kind of numbers. So then we moved down to Broward and Palm Beach County, and uh, we have uh, you know several large coastal discharge structures in Palm Beach County. Basically, everything from the East Coast Protective Levee to the East Drains to the ocean through the network of canals. Um, we have our S-155 structure that is the discharge coastal structure for the C-51 Canal, which is the one right out here in front of the headquarters, and of course G-56 on the Hillsboro. And then as we get down into Pompano and Fort Lauderdale, there are several others that we'll highlight. So here's the coastal structure, S-155, uh, with the accumulation, the picture on the, on the left. You see the orange tuff boom blocking the vegetation there and accumulation of it. Um, you know, it looks like a lot, and it is a lot, but you know, we do allow that to accumulate there and back itself up. We never wanted to quite get to the bridge that you see in the foreground there, but uh, we're not going to chase this on a daily basis either. It, it takes a lot of resources to, to do this, so we'll, we'll get ourselves a nice accumulation here, and then we'll, the picture on the right will bring in heavy equipment to uh, remove this and dip this out. Um, again, we stockpile this on the bank, we let it dry, and then we remove it. Uh, we do have residential people living in, the, you know, uh, residents within this area. There's a, a condominium right here next to the structure and other residential features, uh, so we don't uh, let it sit too long. We want to get it out as quickly as possible. You know, rotting vegetation and stuff has not always had the most pleasant smell and things either, so we want to minimize any impacts to homeowners and the use of the coastal park here. Here's a couple of other secondary inputs into the district's uh, C-51 canal. Here's the uh, G-56 coastal structure on the Hillsboro. You can see a significant amount of lettuce and other debris accumulating along the boom here that has to be dealt with, just like at S-155. And we, as, see, as you see, as we move farther south in the system, it starts converting itself, the, the issue over to more of a trash and litter de debris issue. So this is G-16 canals boom. Here's the C12. It doesn't always have to come from a uh, canal connection. It can come from a culvert connection. It can come from a water control, other types of water control structures. But we tough boom these off, and uh, you know we collect and remove the debris. Here's some general numbers for uh, these structures in FY21. You can see the 155 is the high number, of course, because it's vegetation and vegetation's heavy and wet. So it has a higher um, t tonnage number. Now we move down into the Miami-Dade area. So we have these five coastal structures that I've identified here. Um, all of these basically discharge into the Biscayne Bay area. As you can see, the southernmost one, that S-22, and we have structures further south along the system that experience issues as well. 
Um, some of them discharge right into the, um, the national park. So S27 in Miami-Dade on the C7 canal. Uh, the C7 canal is like 11 miles long. It goes through multiple municipalities on its way to the coast. Um, and it, this structure results in the highest number of calls and complaints that we receive district-wide. It just is, it's, a, it's our hot spot. So this just highlights the number of municipalities that the C7 or the Miami Little River travels through on its way to the coast. And again, the debris can cause issues with flood control and negative impacts to the, to the estuaries. So I just kind of show you what accumulates upstream of some of these structures. This is, again, at S27. You get a lot of get a lot of things such as plastic cups and bottles and styrofoams and things that are going to come in or that are wind blown off the roads and whatnot, but you also get a lot of, we get things like doors and mattresses and couches and coolers and tires and pallets that obviously didn't blow off the road um, come into, this, into our system. This requires a significant amount of, of uh, effort to keep this structure clean. This is uh, the photo on the left has our towboat, one of our towboat fleets, fleet towboats in the water, which has a very large hydraulic basket on the front. It's used to scoop the debris off the, off the boom and accumulate it, place it up on the bank, and then on the picture on the right, you can see the trash truck that we use with the gripper, just like the one that you, probably comes around your neighborhood on a certain day to remove heavy debris from your neighborhood and vegetation and piles it in the truck. Um, sometimes we use other types of equipment like a great all and a dump truck even to, to collect this debris and, and move it out. This is what we strive for at S27, a nice clean <laughs> open structure. Keep in mind too, this structure has the highest congregation in our system of manatees that ingress and egress through this structure. They, you, I don't think you can go there any, at any given time, any given day without seeing a manatee. We've kind of upped our efforts on the C7 canal. We placed a secondary boom um, out at uh, Northwest 27th Avenue, which is several miles west of the coastal structure, in an area where we can get to and we can maintain a, in a secondary boom to work to keep that one clean as well, to try to reduce the amount of trash that flows down the canal to the structure. Um, so this, this has been out there uh, a year ago, say July, I think it went out. Um, so it's been out there quite a while and it, it has proved to be effective. And then this is just some of the other spots that we were already looking at that, that were on the map, but just to show you that it's not just the uh, S27 on C7, but S22 on the, on the C2 has a significant uh, accumulation. S28 on the, S, on the C8 canal, same kind of stuff. And here's some general numbers for tonnage and number of cleanings that we did in FY21. I guess the, uh, <clears throat> the one that jumps off here, obviously, is the S27, 217 tons and 97 cleanings. So we basically dedicated or dedicated to a twice a week cleaning of the structure. So we're going in on Monday morning, and uh, the field station works four tens. So we go in on Thursday, and we do a second cleaning on Thursday. So Mondays and Thursdays, we're out there um, to ensure this stays clean, and we monitor the other locations. We're actually keeping a towboat in the water in, this in these locations now so that we can respond a little quicker and reduce our level of effort required to respond because the towboat is a big, massive boat. It requires a low boy to transport it. It requires a, a crane to come into the site to offload it from the, the low boy trailer into the water and vice versa to take it out. So it's a significant effort, timely. So we've been just leaving one there. You know, and then it works uh, its, its duties along that waterway. Now, that, that, this just kind of defines the problem that we've been facing and, and what we're trying to address through the rulemaking. To get help 
from everyone to share our, the adversity of this um, so we can do a better job at managing these waterways. So I'm going to have a few slides. They're very basic BMPs. You know, none of this is rocket science, as I would want to say. So basically, we're, our BMPs are the installation of a barrier at your discharge points that come into the district system, the Central and South Florida Flood Control System, or other works of the district to prevent that discharge into ours. You're going you're, you're to need periodic maintenance of that barrier. You know, including mechanical removal of vegetation and debris to minimize those discharges, and, and the use of limited, you know, and select use of herbicides, you know, uh, in your waterways to, to control the vegetation. Um, you know, it's I know that a lot of people out there don't want us to use or anyone to use them at all. But what we we would like to see is. Um, from working with my veg management group, I've learned a lot over the last few years about what they call maintenance control use of herbicides. If you let something get out of hand and you get those big blooms like I showed in your pit, my picture, it requires more herbicide use and application and a lot of fallout of vegetation. But if you spot treat and maintain the, that in a, in a more efficient manner, you use significantly less herbicide, a lot less dropout, and a, and a clean and open waterway and a lot less mechanical requirements in the end. So, you know, I know it's unpleasant to some, but herbicides do have their use in their, as a tool in everybody's toolbox. And if they're used correctly, they can be managed correctly to minimize their use and any adverse effects that may come of them. Um, but they are a tool. So this just illustrates, you know, I mean, Typical boom placements, we have different types of connections to the system. We have canal, canal, culvert to canal, water control structure canal. You know, a lot of times what you want to do is configure uh, the boom in a, in a way that it directs the, the, the uh, vegetation or debris to the shoreline so you can grab it. Um, sometimes in a large open waterway like a canal, it's gonna, you're going to get the parabolic shape and boom to the boom regardless of how tight you make it. Um, but it does allow for the cleanup. So these are just standard kind of connections. And these are pictorial sh photos showing those type of setups. Um, as you can see, we always, you always see the district, these orange booms, right? So uh, we've, we've been in this business a long time. <laughs> And we've uh, come to the be you know the better mousetrap. So uh, the, this system um, of this it's a, it's a brand name Tough Boom uh, seems to do the best job for us. It's the most robust system. I mean, when vegetation and debris accumulate on those booms, the amount of force and weight on that is significant. And something flimsy and a piece of rope and stuff snaps and shears and then all, all your efforts get washed downstream. So you need a very stout system that's typically all the fasteners and, and everything's made of stainless steel so it's durable. That floating uh, boom part of that thing needs to be UV resistant so that it has longevity to it. I'm not going to say, I'm going to tell you this isn't the cheapest system or the only way to do this. but with the amount of waterways and miles of canal that we have to manage and the things that we have to do, this has proved itself to be the best mousetrap out there for us. Um, so I go to the next slide. You know, there's multiple ways to do this. And there's multiple companies out there that produce floating barriers. And, you know, I'm not going to name all the names, but there's a blue one, there's a black one, and you could even use a turbidity barrier, right, on smaller. So. You have different applications, you have different size canals, you have different flow regimes. There's, even the district doesn't use the orange one everywhere, but it's our, it's our mainstay. But each individual entity can modify and select their own BMP for their application. And if you're small and you don't have a lot of resources, well, you become resourceful and you can make, there's homemade things out there that can be provided as well. Um, this picture is a little hard to see, but off in the foreground, we used to make them out of wood and, and styrofoam. And they worked effectively, um, but they didn't last. You know, and we were doing a lot of these for our stormwater treatment areas originally when we built a brand new stormwater treatment area and we had 
30 new water control structures to outfit. So uh, we went in and, and uh, tried to come up and devise a way to, to do that economically. And it was initially economic, but in the long run, when the wood rots and the styrofoam deteriorates, you're, you're replacing them on a you know, continuous interval, so we switched to something more robust. But I'm just trying to highlight there's a, a lot of different ways to do this. I could even say to, to you, right, and I'm sure you would know that if I had a riser on a set of culverts like this and I had boards in it and they were a couple of feet above the water, well, they're blocking the vegetation to be, go through. And if I need to discharge, I can go out and do a mechanical application, remove the vegetation, and then pull my boards. I don't, potentially didn't even need to put the floating barrier in. So, you know, you guys are in your business, you know your business well, whether you're in agriculture or you're 298 or you're a special drainage district, you know your system, you know what works and what you need to do to, to help us with this. And we would leave it to you to be able to, to manage that and come up with the ways you would want to do it. Here's an example of one up in uh, Orange County that we were working on after Ian and helping them with a board replacement. And lo and behold, they had a chain link fence across the canal to prevent trash and debris and, and vegetation from going down the canal. Now, I don't know how strong that is. <laughs> and, uh, how, and it may be difficult to clean, but it, it's probably been there for years. And it's, maybe they don't have a, a significant accumulation there. And this is, this is proven to work for them, you know? Um, and, and if it wasn't, it probably wouldn't be there. So just showing you ways to go about this that aren't just costly. There's a lot of ways to skin this cat to try, try to help us. And there's the, our standard booms. You can, you know, I, when you get a close-up photo of one, you can see just how large they are and how stout they are. Um, the booms are on the right. And then the, uh, the, the gray material over that's stacked over there are on the, they're on the left. And then the gray stack material on the right is actually a skirt that can hang from the bottom of the boom to uh, prevent underflow underneath the boom. Now, we don't use those in all of our applications, but we do use them in quite a few locations. This company makes all kinds of applications for that skirt, um, you know, so from something small and minor to something even much stouter than what we're using to prevent the flow down the canal. So, you know, just, you're not seeing anything here that's, like I was saying before, rocket science or anything. It's, it's usually you know your business, you know your system. I'm sure you would know the, the you know, what you would need to do it and implement that within your plan. And through the use of the uh, barriers and mechanical and removal and your herbicide uh, help us manage the system. The more we can collect at upstream locations and throughout the system, the better we're gonna do at collecting it overall and prevent more of it from discharging to the estuaries. Right? So I'll turn it over to Mary Cruz and uh, she'll run us through some of the, the language and then we'll take some questions at the end. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mary Cruz Fincher, and I'm an attorney with the Office of Counsel. I'm going to go through some of the draft rule language that we have. And I think upon entering the boardroom, there were copies so that you could see specifically the language. I'm not going to go verbatim through the language, thankfully. I'm gonna give you a summary and kind of explain the who, what, and when, where. And, um, and I don't, unfortunately, have any pictures to show you. It's just words. So, as Rich mentioned in his presentation, the purpose of this rule is to prevent the discharge of the aquatic vegetation, the trash, and other debris from entering the CNSF system or other works of the district through the use of best management practices. So that's the purpose. This is why we are implementing this rule. So who's covered under this rule? Well, we've got system owners um, who connect of any water management system or water management feature that connect to or make use of the CNSF system or other works of the district, and this would include special districts as well, that are located in the following counties. And as you'll note, 
here in, we have 14 of the 16 counties that are included inside the district's boundaries. So what are the requirements under this proposed rule? Well, system owners are required to establish and implement a vegetation and debris management plan. And this plan must include an implementation schedule and obviously the um, preventative BMP measures, which may include an installation of features to block the transmission and facilitate the removal of the debris and the trash. Um, it could include a mechanical removal component, like uh, some of the slides you saw had equipment removing the trash and debris, and herbicide application as an option. So once you have your plan in place, you're not required to submit it to the district. You must keep a copy of your management plan, though, along with the records demonstrating implementation and maintenance of the management plan. At the district's request, system owners should be prepared to provide a copy of their management plan and implementation and maintenance records within seven days. What are remedial measures under this proposed rule? If the system owner fails to establish a management plan or timely provide a management plan to the district upon request, the district will issue a notice of violation requiring the system owner to provide a management plan within 30 days. The district may also approve an extension of time upon showing of good cause from the system owner. The district has the ability under section 373.129 Florida statutes to take enforcement action, which may include civil penalties of up to $15,000 per day per violation. So what's our proposed timeline or our next steps in the rulemaking process? We are asking that everybody submit written comments by January 17th, and I believe in the agenda there's an email address where you can submit those comments in February or March of 2023, we'll have an additional workshop where we'll discuss any proposed revisions to the draft language um, based on comments or feedback that we've received during this workshop or before January 17th. And then in the spring or the summer of 2023 this year, we're gonna request governing board approval to authorize the publishing of the notice of proposed rule and the adoption of the proposed rule. And this is provided that there isn't a request for a public hearing or changes made to the rule. So this is the proposed timeline and this can change depending on the factors we've discussed. So now I'll open it up for questions um, and discussion. The way we'd like to do it is we'd like to take uh, the in-person participants, if you have any questions or comments, we'd like to take those first and then we'll address the virtual participants. And virtual participants, if you look on the um, slide, you can see how you're able to participate using the raise hand feature or if you're participating via phone. So at this time, I'd invite any in-person commentators or anybody that has a question to please um, make your way to the podium here and just Provide your name for the record. Hi, good afternoon. Seth Bain with Lewis Loman and Walker. Uh, we represent a number of special districts through the area, so uh, that's where our interest in it lies. Um, so just a handful of things on here uh, that I'd have. One is I didn't see a time frame for what you would consider the initial implementation or what the time frame would you would be expecting people to have that plan in place. Um, so, you know, you know, there's a compliance requirement. When would that, what, when would that could kick in in terms of what's that time frame? Is it within six months, a year of the adoption of the rule, et cetera? Um, so, so that would be one item we'd like to, to see what was in there. Um, the next one relates to just to, to try to erase a little bit of the ambiguity. Um, the CNS, C and SF system feels like the thing that we all know what it is, but nobody knows what it is. Um, and to that extent, I actually tried to go on the district's website to see if in the GIS catalog there was a layer that was just that or some other way to define that. You refer to the statute. I went to that statute and that's just a black hole that really didn't get me any closer to understanding. You know, just a layperson or a district engineer could pick it up and go, 
obviously, or not. I, I just don't know if there's a little better way to define that so it's clear um, on what that is. And then that leads to the sort of the second question about that is it's connection to or, impl or, or utilizes, right? So that implements, that, that, that implicates somebody that's not directly connected but is upstream from that. You know, is there some intermediary? So I think I'm a, I'd have a question about, you know, how far up the line, you know, you would have to go. Um, obviously, ultimately, everybody utilizes the system, right? So almost everybody that defines it is going to be implicated in that versus people that have a direct connection to one of your canals, it's obvious. Um, but just in the terms of trying to, again, reduce any ambiguity about that and make sure it's clear who is implicated. And sort of to that extent, you'd almost want to, if there's a way for the district to look at that or, or help define what, what the extent of that scope is or who is applied to it. Um, you've got some draft BMPs. I mean, if there was even uh, what you would think that draft example would be, and this is kind of really post-rule implementation, if there was kind of, um, you know, a lot of districts already, we already have some form of, of, of that plan, mm -hmm. but um, just like we did with um, uh, some of the other cost analysis that were required, there was a you know, group, working group that was put together to put together an example. I mean, uh, to your point today, this isn't necessarily rocket scientist, but sort of an example of what the district wants to see would always be helpful. Um, yeah. And uh, the other last thing would be, you're, to your point, you're not requiring an annual, but, but on, upon request, would it be, um, you would have to show it. Um, it'd be interesting to kind of think of what the district's thinking is on what would be the triggering mechanism for that, whether you actually just sort of have an idea that there's some problem child out there that you want to go talk to. Um, you know, it's, you know, is there, you know, what's going to cause that audit request to uh, come rolling somebody's way? It, you know, it'd be interesting to know just what the district's thinking is on that, that not necessarily that needs to be defined, but, but, but how you think you might implement that, since obviously getting an annual report from all these people every year is probably an administrative task you don't want, and uh, that's why you probably wouldn't want to request it be submitted annually, and great, nobody wants the additional edit burden, but what, what might be the thing that would cause that to come into play Again, you would suspect it's you know problem child, but uh, it'd be interesting to do that. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments, and I appreciate the feedback. And we'll take that into advisement. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tommy Stroud. I'm the executive director of the Lake Worth Drainage District. We cover an area from Hillsborough Canal north to just north of C51, and. Uh, we have similar situation that you deal with, Rich, all the time with regard to vegetation, some trash and things. And we've deployed over 80 of those tough booms kind of throughout our district. Um, and in addition to that, we've got about 1,000 culvert crossings, roadway crossings that kind of serve a similar purpose. So we use those to sort of help us collect and, and manage. Uh, so programmatically, we, we think you're going in the right direction and, and, and we you know, want to work with you on the, on the type of goal. Some of the concerns we might have kind of deal with some of the fine points of the, of the rule. Using the word prevent is a little concerning because uh, in the variation of hydraulic, you know, hydrologic and weather conditions, it's almost impossible to prevent some discharge of particularly floating aquatic vegetation, particularly when canal velocities uh, get really high. It's, it's a surrogate of that is almost like uh, flood protection. You really can't protect communities from flooding because it can be a storm that exceeds the capacity of your design system. Uh, so that's why a lot of times we use the term flood control or, or some other term to explain uh, what the objective of the, the program is. So that, that's one that, that, that you may consider or we suggest looking at that, that terminology. When you look at the uh, language that's contained in the uh, MS4, the, the permitting of the MPDES program, they kind of have a, a general sort of overarching statements which indicates that the department can issue an MS4 permit if the applicant affirmatively provides reasonable assurance that the management program will achieve the reduction of pollutants to the maximum extent practical. That kind of sets a goal and, and everybody's on the goal, but it doesn't give you that sort of hard and fast, 100%, nothing can leave your system un unless they're, you know, or under any condition, extreme or not. And, and then this, the, the last point is, and, and, and I appreciate the presentation and you answered a lot of questions that I had, 
particularly with regard to the, the form of the plan. Uh, I might suggest, and we would probably incorporate it anyway, that this management plan become part of our water control plan that 298 districts, drainage districts are required uh, to, to update on a five-year interval and, and turn into the district. So we'd like to suggest that that may be uh, an applicable format that could be used uh, to contain and, and uh, convey the, the information that, that you're looking at in this rule. And with that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your comments. Um, to the point of um, the ambiguity with the prevent language, I just wanted to say that I don't, our intention is not to require absolute, um, you know, discharge. We, we recognize that that's, you know, not feasible. Right. That's so. what I thought, but I just wanted to make that point just to, just to make sure. So. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dave Dobler. I'm a clean water advocate uh, doing work in Miami-Dade County. I'm very familiar with the C7 and C8 canals and those control structures. Uh, I've been documenting and working on those issues. Um, I'm also a member of the, Bis the Miami-Dade County Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board. And I also am on the steering committee of the Biscayne Bay Marine Health Coalition, uh, which is a nonprofit, uh, just a group of, of, of concerned clean water citizens. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for this rulemaking. Um, this has been a major source of marine debris and plastic trash in Biscayne Bay. And the fact that you guys are taking this up is absolutely thrilling to us uh, who are focused on clean water. Um, I do have a couple of suggestions, um, but first I'm gonna push back on the previous gentleman who spoke here today uh, on the MS4 permits and this maximum extent possible. Um, my opinion is that that is actually exactly why you have all of this trash and debris going into your system in the first place because it uh, really um, uh, kind of gives people a, 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 a get out of uh, doing, the, doing the hard work to doing it, um, with all respect, sir. Um, <laughs> so um, a couple of comments that I have uh, is that, um, you know, on line five of page one, uh, and I'll emphasize uh, the, the ads that I'm suggesting, and I've also got a copy of it here for you. Um, the management plan must include an implementation and maintenance schedule with preventative BMP measures, which may include legislative policies, education, installation of natural or technological features to capture material and block transmission and mechanical collection to facilitate removal. Um, there are policies that people can put in place about education and enforcement um, to stop the mattresses from going in there, right? Uh, and so if we can uh, reduce the amount of street litter that's going into the stormwater systems, that is another possible opportunity for an entity to control the amount of debris that's going into their systems, right? Just as you mentioned, it's easier to get it as upstream as you can. Um, the second thing that I might suggest is an addition on the, uh, uh, the main goal, which is measured required to prevent discharges of aquatic vegetation, trash, sediments, nutrients, and other debris. Um, you know, sediments can impact your necessity to dredge. Uh, they can restrict the water flow if you have a large amount of sediments coming from upstream. Um, so, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I think that was on page two that I was giving you. Um, on page one, yeah, I didn't number these myself, I apologize for that. Um, so on page one, uh, I might suggest on line five again, uh, this is uh, the district must maintain its works including the C and SF system free of vegetation, trash, uh, sediments, nutrients and other debris that can lead to blockage of canal structures as well as degrade water quality, resulting in increased risk of flooding, navigational hazards, downstream pollution, impacts to aquatic life, and impediments to water supply. Um, because it's not just about blocking the flow, it's also about how do we make sure that our downstream waterways are protected. And the final thing, uh, or 
number, number four is um, if people are having to create these best management plans, um, why would it be so difficult for them to automatically submit them on an annual or you know, uh, every second year, um, just automatically submit them? Right, give you the opportunity to ensure that people have at least come up with the plan, even if you don't look at it, right? Even if you don't make comments on it, uh, if they are required to submit the plan, then they actually have to put it, put forth the effort, and that would just be a, a, an easy way to ensure compliance. And finally, and this isn't really related directly to the rule, um, but I would like to make a comment on the the, the tough booms. Um, the current booms that are capturing debris, it's my understanding that they're actually not primarily designed to capture debris. That's kind of a secondary function of them. And their primary function is to keep boating, boaters and kayaks and uh, all kinds of devices away from the control structures, right? It's a safety risk. Um, and they're not as well designed to capture trash and debris because they have gaps in them. Uh, and the gaps allow material to go through them in a, a couple of slides on page six and page 17. You could actually see uh, debris in the photos that has gone beyond uh, the boom. And so either with the tough booms, um, seeing if there can be a, a, a little shielding between the gaps or looking at uh, ways in which they can become more effective um, if we can just close the gap, that'd be great. And also, any of the booms should go roughly six inches underneath the water uh, in order, because a lot of floatables will actually float underneath when the water pressure comes, because they're not necessarily designed for capturing trash. Um, so those are my comments. I've got uh, uh, written versions of them um, that I'll leave behind for you folks, but I just want to express my gratitude again for um, for focusing on these issues. It's great, thank you. I think thank most of the questions you asked, we, we need, need to do a little homework on, but it, it, as far as addressing the final comments on the, the gaps, uh, we are working with the manufacturer um, to purchase, they have a device that goes in the gap. Um, we learned of that recent, within the last year, and I believe we're working in the Miami-Dade area to add those to the booms. Um, we do have the skirts. Keep in mind, yes, uh, they do prevent the boat traffic, but it's a dual, it's a dual operation because these are designed by the company to stop trash and debris from going down. I mean, the big structures and things that these are used for up north are like in front of dams, in front of reservoir discharges, on rivers. They are designed to capture debris and they're strong enough to capture debris and very resilient. Um, they do have the, um, the skirts on them. They have multiple different designs of the skirt to go on them. Um, it's just that in certain locations, um, like in Miami-Dade, we've been a little reluctant to deploy the skirt because of the number of manatees in the area and not sure of the impacts to the manatees and their ability to swim through and under them. Um, so keeping them as clean as possible and doing it more th often than we did previously to keep that down also prevents stuff from sliding under because it is a water pressure kind of uh, phenomenon, right? So the more pressure on it, the more opportunity for it to blow under. So if we keep them clean, um, they do a pretty good job. And we are, like I said, we are looking at the, at this, the, the gap pieces to put in. That's great. And if you're in the Miami area, I think you'll see them within a number of months. You'll start to see them being implemented in the Miami data. Great, it might also be uh, helpful to, um, to, to explore and show some additional designs. You did a great job showing a couple of like the, just the booms specifically, but I think there's some other uh, technological innovations that um, some people might be interested in seeing and not that you're recommending any specific technology, but you know, there are litter traps and, 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 and other kind of um, you know, conveyor belt type systems that may just prove inspiration uh, to folks um, who might be looking at ways to solve this problem. And so without making specific recommendations, um, showing a wider variety of solutions um, may also get people's wheels thinking. Um, I, I did forget there's one final thing um, that, I, that, I, that I did make a note on. Um, I'm a little uh, concerned about the inclusion of herbicide application in this policy for a very specific reason. Because the goal of this rule is to prevent discharges of vegetative material, 
herbicidal application would actually introduce more vegetative debris when the plants are sprayed and allowed to die over the next few days and weeks. So if they're going to apply the material, if they're going to apply the herbicide and that material dies, then that is now dead material that will very quickly make its way into the system. And so I might suggest that um, either herbicide application be removed or um, indicated in some way that that's almost a last ditch, kind of a last ditch effort. Um, because I, I, I've heard water management districts say many, many times that, uh, that you are looking to minimize herbicidal application as well. So um, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments for our in-person participants? Okay, we'll move to our virtual participants. Jan, has anyone raised their hand to make a comment? Um, the first one on the list is uh, Amy Eason. Amy, you'll have to unmute yourself. Got it. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, great. This is Amy Eason. I'm the stormwater manager for the city of Port St. Lucie. Um, as I was reviewing the uh, proposed rule, I think I had some of the similar questions that some of the previous people have have asked. Um, for instance, you know, we have a, an MS4, and you know, we actually do pick up litter on a on a regular basis and um, have a maintenance program in place. But um, our, my questions are, to what extent are you requiring the plan to go beyond the project culverts? I mean, we wouldn't want to have to submit a plan that includes the entire city. Um, you know, what are the requirements of the plan? Um, and is there an implementation plan also set up for this rule? Um, are, is the district going to provide templates of what you're going to require in this plan? And um, if uh, there are several entities that are discharging into the facility, you know, how would you know which one to ask for the plan? You know, there's going to be several people. I don't know if you're just going to try to go after everybody to try to figure out where the vegetation came from. Um, just curious on those those items. And those are my several questions. Um, and I have put them in the in the Q and A of Zoom as well, so you'll have them on record. Thank you, Amy, for your comments and questions. Okay, the next one is Alfred Malafado. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. I just want to reiterate a prior question that was raised by uh, my colleague Seth Bain about the timing of when the plan would need to be put into place and implemented. Have you decided that yet? There's no language to answer your question at this time. No draft language for that. Oh, Chris, so that's basically to be decided. Correct. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Next we have Jared Greenberg. Jared, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, uh, can, can, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I had to switch off phones going to the computer. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Jared Greenberg, mechanical engineer, worked several years in the power industry, and I was curious on your mechanical removal techniques. Um, I don't see any traveling screens being used in cooperation with your booms that would allow you to have um, less manpower and less uh, resources on your heavy affected areas. 
Has the Southfield Water Management Department ever looked at doing traveling screens in the um, areas of high trash concentrations? I can, I can address that question. So in the Miami-Dade area, due to the fact that we have, we need to allow for movement of manatees within the canal system and through the water control structures, we don't really have the ability to put a travel, uh, a, a bar screen or some type of mechanism across the structure to collect the debris and then mechanically remove it. So we rely on the tough boom and our um, mechanical means that we use with our towboats and whatnot to do that. Um, in other locations, it potentially could be looked at. It's also a, as with everything, you know, very cost prohibitive in some cases, but um, we do have them implemented on all of our pumping station intakes there. We have an automated trash system on all of those, which number now uh, close to 90 facilities uh, district-wide that have an automated uh, trash removal system. But the Miami-Dade area, due to the manatees, is really, um, you know, an issue. And uh, as yeah, as the the uh, reason I ask is, uh, um, if you travel up to Vero Beach and look up their uh, control structure they incorporated the boom on a diagonal and then the debris goes into like a side re retention area it's off of aviation boulevard right across from the indian river drive um or any river county tax collector office and they've got from what i can tell from google earth one two three four five five traveling screens set up um and that would allow you the manatees to pass under the boom and not be affected by the traveling screens collecting up the debris. Of course, it goes on into the design aspect and it looks like some thought was brought into the one used in Vero Beach. Um, and since it's already there, I, I, you know, why not copy that into other areas that would be affected by the manatees um, and then to use technology um, that we already have versus spraying and using herbicides for a, a more mechanical solution versus a manpower solution. Thank you for uh, your guys' effort in this, by the way. That's all I have. Thank you. Next, we have Jim Gorton. Hi, guys. I'm with Martin County. And uh, I had a couple of questions. The first one is, how do you intend to get the information out to agricultural entities who manage canal systems? Would FDACs be a avenue to get that information to them? That's something that we see in our county. Um, some of those um, non-298 ag entities have some floating fetch issues. Um, the next question is, how do you handle natural creeks that discharge into um, canal systems? The creeks in a lot of instances have um, no embankment right of to manage those creeks, which would make um, debris removal difficult without removing preserve areas that exist on both sides of those creeks. So those are my questions. Thank you for your questions. Yep, thank you. Next, we have Cindy Dwyer. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is Cindy Dwyer with Miami-Dade County Planning Division. And uh, thank you for offering this workshop. I found it very interesting. I was wondering for the vegetative debris that's hauled up onto the canal banks and allowed to dry is it hauled off to the landfill or can it be composted? I'll let Rich answer. Uh, in areas where we can compost and dispose of it on district lands, we do that, but uh, um, you know, and then in cases where it's intermixed with trash and debris, uh, it has to be properly disposed of. So based on the condition of the vegetation and what comes up, we make the, the appropriate decision on how to dispose of it. And then in, in cases where you compost it, uh, 
is it offered to farmers or is there, I mean, it's just left on district lands or is there a commercial use for it? At this time, we just, you know, dispose of it on district land to compost. You'd, um, it once the water drains and that dries up, it it, it significantly reduces in its in its volume. Um, I don't know that we've had generated enough to start becoming a viable commercial entity thing for it. But as times change, we can always look at different ways to manage it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're back to Jared Greenberg. Jerry, are you there? Okay, his hand's no longer raised, so that might have just been an, an error. On, um, the next one is Madeline Kaufman. Hi there, this is Maddie Kaufman from Debris Free Oceans, a nonprofit in Miami-Dade County. And I just wanted to also thank you for hosting this workshop and this rulemaking. We're super grateful and just wanted to quickly emphasize um, the importance of prevention before we need to do this expensive removal from our waterways. And so I was wondering if there are initiatives where you use the data of the contents of what's being uh, removed from these systems to inform educational outreach campaigns or other um, prevention initiatives. For example, in Miami-Dade, we uh, just launched a business certification program to incentivize businesses to eliminate single-use plastics. And so guests yeah, was just wanted to place an emphasis and ask more about kind of educational outreach initiatives to prevent it from reaching our systems in the first place. Thank you. Um, we have no others at this time. Do we have any written questions submitted? Okay, I have a question from Mike Grimm. Who is the system owner for Lake Istokopoga in Highlands County? Is there a plan for Lake Istokopoga? Thank you for your comment, Mike. There are some written comments that have also been um, said audibly, so I'm just gonna bypass those. Rhonda Watkins asks, how do we get copies of the proposed rule language? Rhonda, right now the proposed rule language is available on our website. Okay. And um, Jan has said that she sent it to you. Jim Gordon has asked, how will this rule apply to Lake O discharges to the C44 canal? Thank you for your question, Jim. We'll take that under advisement. And all of the other questions are have been already asked audibly. So unless we have any other virtual participants or in-person participants, I think We've covered everyone's questions. I would just like to say, you know, there's been some talk about in other innovative technologies to use to um, 
remove trash debris and vegetation from the system. Obviously, if you're a, um, a user of the, you know, a discharger to the system, the district would review and, in, and um, you know, consider any type of uh, innovative measures that a private or a governmental agency wants to use to remove vegetation from their, from their system, and we don't have to just rely on the tough boom. I think what I was trying to display in, the, in my presentation was the fact that we're trying to do this economically. Um, you know, if you have many connections, as the district does, and different things, that it can quickly escalate in cost and, and, and resources necessary to do this. So um, obviously, if, if other municipalities and things have come up with great ways to do this, it, you know, I would encourage that. Um, I would say that I have, uh, the district has submitted for grant money for a uh, conveyor system uh, like pilot project at the S27 structure that we hope to secure funding for that through the, the grant process. Uh, we too have a lot of uh, pulls on our resources and money for maintaining and managing our system. Um, you know, a mechanically driven system to, um, for a multi-gated water control structure such as our coastal salinity structures would run into the multi-millions of dollars to design and construct. Um, and, uh, you know, as we make modifications and upgrades to our system and improve things, they are, all of those things are being considered during the process of the designs um, and to, to do, but obviously uh, we are too trying to do it in an economical and manageable way. Um, but we are open to all of these ideas and, and we actively look for these things. Um, one of the things, there's a lot of challenges to the system in that, you know, to, uh, we've looked at a lot of the types of mechanical removing boats and things that are out there that a lot of other areas around the country have. But guess uh, all of our low bridge, our at grade low bridge crossings, which are thousands and thousands across the system, are very prohibitive to a lot of the um, boat type devices that are out there. We literally, you know, uh, only have in some cases a few feet of clearance from the top of the water to the low member on the crossing bridge, which is very restrictive um, to movement of, of any type of uh, a boat for mechanical removal. Um, so every one of the applications may be good in certain areas, but not work in other areas and has to work within the system and be viable. But um, we certainly are looking at all of these different options. Like I said, we had the grant in. And as we modify, upgrade, refurbish um, this, the system over the years, we will be looking at um, you know, opportunities to include uh, you know, systems to do this, these uh, removal projects. Um, and some of the pump stations that I had ma mentioned right now are on some of these major waterways. And the district uh, right now is in, in the process of installing a major um, automated trash rake system on our S9 structure, which discharges uh, into Water Conservation Area 3A. Um, in recent years, uh, in the Fort Lauderdale area, we it installed a new uh, automated trash rake system with conveyor belt removal. Uh, at our S13 structure on C11 Canal in Broward County. So as opportunities come up and as we move towards refurbishment of the system, we certainly are looking at these things. I just want everybody to know that uh, we're not just relying on uh, these, the labor intensive uh, tow boat and mechanical removal operations, but we are investigating into all of these, these other options that are out there and investing quite a bit of money into those options as well. Thank you. Well, I thank all of you for attending, both in person and virtually. We're going to conclude this workshop. Um, be on the lookout. We will have another workshop come February or March of this year. Um, we thank everybody for their feedback and their comments. We will take this into advisement, and um, there will also be any revisions you'll see on our website of the draft rule language prior to the next workshop. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>